In this video, I'm going to provide a quick example of an actual ERP study so that you can see how ERPs are used to answer interesting questions about the operation of the mind and brain. I'll be talking about this study by Jim Tanaka and Tim Curran. I'm going to gloss over the details, so I encourage you to read the paper. It's a great paper for both beginners and experts. It focuses on the N170 component, which is widely used to study face perception. Here are the stimuli from a typical N170 experiment. Subjects were shown a sequence of faces and cars, each of which was flashed briefly on a computer screen. For each subject, a face ERP was computed by averaging across all the faces, and a car ERP was computed by averaging across all the cars. The waveforms shown here are averaged across all the subjects. We call these grand average waveforms. As you can see, the N170 wave, the negative deflection that peaks at around 170 milliseconds after stimulus onset, was much bigger for the faces than for the cars. Many studies have found similar results. Faces generate a larger N170 than just about any other stimulus category. Of course, fMRI studies have also found that faces generate larger bold responses than most other stimuli in certain brain areas. This research has led to a fundamental theoretical question. Is face perception special? That is, do we have domain-specific neural systems that are solely used for face perception? That might explain why inverting an image has a larger impact on the perceptibility of faces than on other sorts of objects. But maybe these effects are a consequence of the fact that virtually all humans have a lifetime of experience in perceiving faces. In other words, are there special purpose processes for faces, or do we use the same processes for all stimuli that we're experts at perceiving? This is the question that Tanaka and Curran wanted to answer using the N170 component. Specifically, they wanted to know whether the N170 is impacted by perceptual expertise. To answer this question, they recruited people with different kinds of perceptual expertise. They found 15 bird experts and 15 dog experts, and then they showed these people pictures of birds and pictures of dogs. They used a 2x2 factorial design with a between-subjects factor of expertise type and a within-subjects factor of stimulus type. On each trial, subjects saw a category name, followed by a picture of a bird or a picture of a dog. At the end of the trial, subjects had to indicate whether or not the picture they just saw was a member of the specified category for that trial. But the specific task doesn't usually have much impact on the N170. If the N170 component is influenced by expertise, then they predicted they would see a larger N170 for birds than for dogs in bird experts, but a larger N170 for dogs than for birds in dog experts. And that's exactly what they found. You can see that the N170 was larger for bird pictures than for dog pictures in the bird experts. But the N170 was larger for dog pictures than for bird pictures in the dog experts. So just as almost everyone is highly experienced with face processing, and almost everyone has a larger N170 for faces than for other kinds of stimuli, bird and dog experts have a larger N170 for stimuli in their domain of expertise. This is consistent with the idea that face perception is achieved by a set of general purpose processes that aren't face specific, but depend on expertise. Now, one experiment isn't enough to settle this complex issue, but this study certainly provides useful evidence.